Hello, my name's Bronwyn Cooper. I'm a podiatrist here in Sydney who's passionate about the effects of footwear on our patients' gait, their clinical conditions, their symptoms, their pathologies. Whether it's a positive effect through some of the modern technologies of some of these lightweight and heavier curved rocker soles such as NBT, hocker, midfoot striking shoes, fit flops, etc. But also the negative effects, meaning shoes uh, that may inadvertently interfere with our patients' movement patterns and may be either creating or adding to the very problems that they present to we health professionals about. So if I pose the question, are all exercise shoes good for us? I mean, we know exercise is good for us, but not all exercise shoes are good for us, absolutely. Um, and when I'm talking about this, uh, I'm just going to illustrate the very flexible type soles that were originally around in the 60s and then we had the medicating of sports shoes so we got to the modern era where for many, many years we've had some very highly structured sport shoes with lots of different features in. And recently I was looking at this and the effects on some of my patients' movement patterns and their problems and I suddenly realised that in fact there are more features in common with a structured sport shoe and an orthopaedic shoe than not. So what do I mean by that? Well I'm referring to about 12 millimetres of heel elevation, I'm referring to motion control and pronation control, arbitrary support, excessive cushioning, things of that nature. Obviously they both should have safe treads that are appropriate, but really the only differences that I could particularly see between a heavily structured shoe and an orthopaedic shoe are around the uppers. Uh, obviously mesh versus leather, but the last of the shoe, the shape that it's made on, generally an orthopaedic shoe will be made around a broader and deeper toe box and last generally to accommodate deformed and swollen feet problems. And then what was also very disturbing was actually the thought that really it's very hard to find any position statements on what constitutes good safe shoes for people to participate in sport or activities, whether it's walking, let alone running, because we've really been told that we need a lot of technology to run and walk safely and yet injuries haven't been going down. So when I researched this I was a bit shocked to find that the last position statement that I could certainly find actually came out of America from the Academy of Paediatricians and it's about kids' shoes. And their seven points were written in 1991, some 20 years ago. Now, two of them are still quite common. They're still, by the way, very applicable today, absolutely. But two of them seem to be very applicable for sport shoes. And one of them is, is quite interesting. The seventh point says, physicians should avoid and discourage the commercialization and meteorization of footwear. And I think, in a way, that pretty much solves it all. Uh, I looked today on three big shoe companies' websites, just as a representative uh, fishing expedition, as it were. I looked at ASICS, I looked at Nike, I looked at New Balance. All of these people put out a lot of technical information about the features in different model shoes. After all, ASICS has 186 in their current catalogue here in Australia. Admittedly, some of those are different colours. Um, so there's not 186 different shoes across all sports, but there's a huge, huge, huge number of different models in any one brand. Now, the features that are put into the shoes in the case of ASICS are actually mentioned here in their catalogue in respect of every single thing bar heel height. Unfortunately, that's not mentioned. However, if we use New Balance uh, as the opposite extreme, they obviously think heel height's very important, and I agree with them to the point that across their range of running shoes they've got four different heel heights. They have a 12 millimetre, an 8, a 4 and a 0 millimetre drop as it's referred to, which is also interesting. For those of you that don't know, the sports shoe industry call this drop, uh, we call it or ramp height. We call it heel height in the shoe industry generally, so is it any wonder people get confused? And although there's some good technical information out there, it's certainly not in the stores. Some of this is given to podiatrists and other health professionals. Where do people get their knowledge or information or advice about what shoe to buy when they go to a sports store? They get it from the shoe store itself and their staff, or they get it from health professionals, or they just ask their mates or whatever in the running club too, I guess. Um, and that makes it very difficult when you can't access this sort of information. But if we now just go across to another little publication, which is Nike's story about why they've gone so strongly towards a uh, more minimalist model called Nike Free, their quite lengthy booklet here really explains that for a shoe to be good for us for 
functioning and running, etc., it should be as close as possible to Barefoot. So the story's all here, and yet I can't find it on their website. And that means this information is really not accessible to the people that go on those shoes. So uh, the subject itself um, originally was covered in Born to Run, um, a good little lay person's read, but every health professional still should read this in my opinion. But just this year, a fantastic publication came out of the US as well called Tread Lightly. A uh, very important publication that explains a lot about the influence of shoes, well worth reading, once again, lay people as well as health professionals. So what I've tried to um, put across today is simply the fact that all sport shoes are definitely not created equal as we know. However, however, some people I think are absolutely underestimating the influence they're having on their patients' clinical conditions. Now that's the subject of another video, but I can, uh, and I will address this in, in a future video. At this stage, I would certainly suggest to people though that uh, they really need to look very carefully at what shoes their patients are wearing. Uh, and they really need to make some separate investigations if they really want to understand whether the shoes may be influencing the problems they're presenting with. And I'm not just referring to runners, I find this is the case with walkers, even people who are middle-aged and older who are just walking for exercise or going to a gym and they might have osteoarthritis. It may not be an Achilles tendon type problem or some of the typical runner's injuries people talk about. So I hope that's given you some food for thought and I certainly look forward to contributions from you via our website. There's more information about this on our website and some of the linked websites. Thank you.